The aftershocks continued the day after Ontario's Premier dropped the constitutional bombshell on a court decision. This one would have prevented the Ford government from cutting the size of Toronto City Council. Ford's decision to recall the Ontario legislature tomorrow will be to invoke the clause. That's attracted plenty of ongoing reaction, including the current and a former Prime Minister. Here is former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, whose daughter, by the way, is Caroline, and she's Ford's Attorney General. Here's what he had to say. If it's part of the package, it's not uh, anti-democratic to use it, to invoke it where if you're the elected premier of a given province. I've always felt that once the Supreme Court of Canada made a decision that that strengthened Canada and strengthened our unity and that I was personally, I had difficulty with anybody invoking a provision that overrode, could override the Supreme Court of Canada. And, and that's why I opposed it then, and that's why I oppose it today. Well, Justin Trudeau finally gave his official reaction to the move, although he wasn't commenting on the specific case in Premier Ford's sites. Anytime a government uh, chooses to invoke the notwithstanding clause to override the Charter's protections, it has to be done uh, deliberately, uh, carefully, and with the utmost uh, forethought and reflection. Um, as uh, my government said yesterday, we're uh, disappointed by the uh, provincial governments uh, in Ontario's uh, choice to, to uh, invoke the notwithstanding clause, uh, but I won't be weighing in on the debate on how big Toronto Municipal Council should be. So this extremely rare move, which the Premier, by the way, says could be used more often in the future, has prompted some speculation other Premiers would be more inclined to use it to veto charter rights cases they disagree with in the future. Well, let's find out what two former Premiers think. Surely at times they were tempted to drop the veto they didn't like, or maybe not. Alison Redford was Alberta Premier from 2011 to 2014. She joins us from Calgary. And Bob Ray was Ontario Premier from 1990 to 1994. Five, he joins us from Toronto. I'll start with you, Bob. Did you ever face a case when you thought, I'm going to reach into that toolbox for a hammer? Not once. Not for, not for a picosecond. Uh, uh, that may have had something to do with that I, because I was very much involved in the constitutional discussions in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and felt very strongly that uh, the Charter was a very fine achievement for Canada, and that it was uh, the notwithstanding clause was, was not going to be used in Ontario. Up until now, it's never been used, either by a Conservative government, a Liberal government, or an NDP government. Uh, so what the Premier has done in this instance is, um, I hope, uh, completely unusual, because it, in my view, it's, uh, it's not necessary and it's an extremely unwise uh, use of, uh, of government power. Alison Redford, do you think it's something that you could, should be available to be used, and did you ever feel you had a chance to use it? Well, certainly it's available to be used, and I would say that because it's in the Charter, that um, it is something that a Premier can use if, if they feel necessary. I have two comments. When I was Attorney General, we passed an awful lot of legislation that dealt with controlling gangs and dealing with drugs. And many times we were criticized and told that they thought, many people, our critics thought, that it would be unconstitutional. Our view at the time was to let the courts decide, and if the courts did not decide in our favor, to then possibly consider it. We never got to that point because our legislation was held to, 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 to be constitutional. I do think it's interesting because both as Attorney General, as a Premier, I think one thing that we generally expect is that before the notwithstanding clause is used, that governments exhaust the courts. And I think it's quite exceptional that in this case, the notwithstanding clause is being used before all of the appeal processes have taken place, which I think then means that we're thinking about the notwithstanding clause, or Premier Ford is thinking about it, in a way that brings it into the legislative process, which is different, I think, than what the people who drafted the Constitution and agreed to the Constitution in 1982 intended. Yeah, Bob, but it's, it's a power that 
was set aside to be used for precisely this sort of eventuality where a premier objects to a finding of unconstitutional behavior and opts out. Isn't that what it's there for? I, I know you're going to say, well, it's got to be proportional, but Toronto City Council decision seems small, but it's a political entity that's got more people in all of Atlantic Canada. So, it, so any meddling with it is a significant development, isn't it? Yeah, that's why the, 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 for the premier to change the size of the council in the middle of an election, uh, and let me just stress that again, in the middle of an election, to insist that the boundaries be re redrawn. Imagine if, 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 the, if the federal government decided in the middle of a federal election to change the boundaries of the federal parliament in the middle of an election. Uh, I would think that you would find that a little odd, Don, and might say that this was an unusual kind of meddling. I think that's the basis of this, this, this whole discussion. It's not about does the province of Ontario have the right to change the, the, the size of a municipal council? Clearly they do. That's not the issue. The issue is how do they do that? And do they have to exercise their powers in a way that fully respects the need to consult and discuss and the need to deal with the views of, of, of people locally? This was not done in this case, and that's why Judge Bellababa made the decision that he did. He, 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 this is not about can the province change the boundaries of the city. It's about can the province change the boundaries of a city in the middle of a civic election. And I think, I don't think anybody should have been shocked by Judge Bellababa's decision to say uh, changing the rules in the middle of a game, and you described it, for a city of 2.3 million people in the middle of a municipal election, it's a pretty strange thing to do. Yeah, Alison Redford, you know, the Constitution does say that provinces, that cities are basically children of the provinces. So did you find that judgment so surprising and difficult to swallow as well? Well, I, I think that apart from the particular issue, that certainly the Premier has the prerogative to do it. As I said, I think that, that and Bob might want to speak to this, my recollection of those discussions, and I wasn't at the table, was that what Premier Blakeney and Premier Lougheed were concerned about was once the courts had been exhausted, whether or not the courts or government would have the final say. Uh, I certainly think that it's appropriate that government does, and at the, at the end of the day, ultimately, the people of Ontario will decide whether or not Premier Ford made the right decision. But Bob, I'd be interested in your comments in terms of this idea of actually exhausting the, the legal steps before the constitutional challenge or the notwithstanding clauses is invoked. Yeah, the notwithstanding clause was introduced, but was introduced, and I appreciate Alison give me a chance to respond to that because I think she's absolutely right. I think it was it was introduced as a safety valve. You had let's let's take Canadians back to those days. There were several premiers who objected to the courts having the final word on issues that affected provincial jurisdiction. And the compromise that was finally reached was to say, OK, uh, you can have the, non, the notwithstanding clause will become part of the Constitution, but it's only to be exercised, as Mr. Trudeau said in the clip that you showed, with the utmost of discretion and only at the conclusion of a judicial process where you say, well, we, we respectfully disagree with the court. And at that point, there would be an opportunity for people to, to rule on it. But I think one has to also say that in Ontario's case, um, as soon as the charter became the law, uh, it very quickly became the, the view of, of, of a lot of different people in different political parties that you really don't want to get into the business of second guessing the courts and, and saying uh, that what the Supreme Court of Canada says or what a court says in a particular instance is wrong. There's, a, there's absolutely a right for Mr. Uh, for Mr. Ford to appeal the decision of, of Justice Bella Baba and to take it all the way to the Supreme Court if he wants. The issue in this case is all about timing. It's all about, can you do this in the middle of an election? And I think that's what has created the fuss and that's what cr has created the, the reaction. One thing that's also somewhat surprising is Ford basically said, I'll do it again if I'm provoked into doing it again. And I'm, I'm curious what you all think, because I always felt the reason provinces didn't do it more often or at all in most provinces' cases is it seemed like an emergency escape route. It was, it was elevated to a very high uh, threshold before it would be used. And I wonder if Ford uses it semi-regularly, whether other premiers might jump in and say, yeah, we can use it. Uh, Alison Redford, what do you think? 
Well, I think that's a really interesting element. And when Premier Ford talked about that today, I do think it could fundamentally change the nature of federal provincial relations because now you have a situation where either the federal government or individual provincial governments could contemplate that as part of the process as they're drafting legislation. Um, and, and I think that all of a sudden, political debates start to change because you may have a party that has a particular point of view that knows that if they were to um, oppose a government and that these things were to go to court, that governments might be prepared to step in and use that more quickly. I think it does change uh, the test and the, the bar. Um, but, but I have to say, I agree with the, the Attorney General in Ontario that the fact is that it is in the Constitution. Uh, it certainly is something that, that, uh, that uh, you know, the Premier and other Premiers would have the right to look at um, or the federal government to look at. I, I think it does change the nature of the conversation. At the end of the day, ultimately, as I said, political leaders will decide whether to use it and people then will decide whether or not they want those people leading them. And that, I think, is, is could, democracy. So could it be catching, Bob? Could it go, oh, go that's to the point worries. where it becomes almost routine? No, that's what worries me. That's what worries me a great deal, is that uh, the respect for the Charter uh, has been an important foundation of our, of our whole way of life uh, since 1982. Um, and suddenly we have a, a premier who's attacking uh, a judge uh, who goes out of the way to say, who the hell is he anyway? He's appointed. He got it wrong when he said he was appointed by uh, Premier McGuinty, who was one of his opponents. Um, you know, so th this, is, uh, this is a very, very troubling development. And I think we, we do need to understand that, yes, it's in the Constitution, but uh, there's a lot of things that we need to be aware of. It's not just the Charter doesn't create rights. The Charter recognizes rights that are there. And one of the democratic rights that's there is that your right to vote in a civic election won't be suddenly taken away or dramatically changed in the middle because the premier, in this case, very clearly, because he stated it on several occasions, has an animus towards several members of Toronto City Council. And that's what I think is, right. is, is important to stress. The motivation behind why you're doing it and how you're doing it is critically important. And that's what I think is really, really deeply troubling about this case. Last quick point to you, Alison Redford, on this. Brian Mulroney sort of wondered today why it's even in the Constitution. And I'm wondering, is it a legitimate question to maybe revisit this and remove it from the Charter, or is that not necessary? Well, I, I think that uh, there are a number of issues in terms of federal provincial relations that need to be looked at, and I'm not sure that we will ever have the circumstances where it's time to open up the Constitution again, uh, or whether governments will want to do that. But if that is the case, I think this is something that does need to be considered. And I think one of the things to look at is the history as to when it's been used, which is very often when you have political leadership that is looking to appeal to a popular sentiment. And uh, whether that's a good or a a bad thing. That's the reality of what we have now. And I think that if there is a point in the future where the Constitution is opened up, I think fundamentally it will be part of what needs to be talked about. Okay, quick last word to you on that, Bob. Oh, I don't think we're going into that swamp again for a while, Don. <laughs> I, I think, agree. I, don't, well I said. agree. I don't think we're <laughs> heading there. <laughs> that swamp can stay undrained. Okay, I'm, I'm thank you there. all. It's I appreciate it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Good discussion.